In this module, we now begin digging into how microorganisms make decisions based upon the input from their environment. This is termed regulation. Here are the topics we will cover, and here are the learning outcomes. Here is a brainstorming activity for you. Do you think this is, in fact, a virulence factor? Please read the text that's shown here on the lecture slide, where it talks about Streptococcus pneumoniae and how it increases the expression of an oligopeptide transporter 2.5 fold when it comes in contact with lung epithelial cells. How could you test this? Why do you think the strain does this? The way that you, you could, you may think it's a virulence factor, you may think it's not, it's up to you. The way you can test this is you take S. pneumoniae and you create a strain that can no longer produce this oligopeptide, you make a mutation in it, and then you then challenge it in a virulence assay. You infect the mouse with it, and you see if it is as, it is as virulent as a typical wild-type strain of this pathogen. And that would tell you. Why does microbe do this? Probably does this because when it comes in contact with the human cells, it then is in, it has these oligopeptides available. It then transports them in and uses them as nutrients. This exercise shows the importance of regulation and why understanding it is important. The microorganism needs to change its behavior based upon the environment and us understanding it would be very important for treating these diseases. If we found out that this oligopeptide transporter was important for virulence, we may figure out ways to inhibit it, and that could be a drug that could treat this. All regulation of microorganisms begins with some signal, denoted by the yellow star, outside in the environment. This signal indicates something important in the environment to which the microbe will want to respond. In some manner, the signal is transmitted inside the cell, recognized, and then alters gene expression. This reaction can happen during transcription, translation, or at the post-translational level. Regulation has a few common properties. First, it needs to be specific. If the cell encounters lactose, it will want to turn on the lactose catabolism genes, not the xylose catabolism genes. Second, it has to plug into the global state of the cell. Even if a cell encounters lactose, it may still not turn on lactose catabolism. What if glucose is present, a better carbon source? If so, the cell won't waste time expressing lactose catabolism genes. In bacteria and archaea, Regulation is typically rapid, both in turning on genes and in turning them off. Organisms that exist as single cells must react quickly to the environment and take advantage of what's there before other competitors. Finally, most gene regulation is tuned. A common misconception is a light switch mentality about regulation. It is either on or off. In reality, even when regulation is off, it's turned down, but there's still gene expression. It then goes up to match the demand. When conditions in the environment change, the expression of genes often has to change. This change in the environment is sensed by the cell as the presence or absence of a small molecule. Allosteric proteins will detect these signal molecules. An allosteric protein contains a second site different from its active site, that when bound, changes the enzyme's activity. As you can see in this example, when the allosteric protein binds its allosteric effector, it is then inactive. Binding to the allosteric site will cause a conformational change in the protein. Allosteric proteins are most often associated with transcription or enzyme activity. There are numerous points in gene expression where regulation can occur. At the DNA level, changing the structure of the chromosome can allow or limit access to a gene. DNA rearrangements can add or remove a promoter from a gene. Also, 
DNA methylation may encourage or inhibit the expression of genes. Gene expression can be modulated by regulating whether mRNA is made by influencing initiation, elongation, or termination of messenger RNA synthesis. The stability of mRNA transcripts can also change. Finally, the binding of proteins, RNA, or small molecules to the messenger RNA can affect its transcription or translation. The activity of already synthesized proteins can also be regulated. The translation or processing of a protein may change in response to an environmental signal. A protein may become more or less stable. Protein function can also be regulated by interactions with other proteins or small molecules and by covalent modification. The items in red on this slide are some of the most common methods of regulation in prokaryotes. Regulation of transcription, especially its initiation, is one of the most common ways to change gene expression in prokaryotes. Changing transcription usually involves changing the activity of RNA polymerase at the gene of interest, and this often involves a regulatory protein. The regulatory protein will have two domains. One domain binds the DNA, while the second domain responds to a signal. I consider these to be allosteric proteins. It is also possible to regulate the elongation and termination of transcription, but this type of modulation is rare. We are now going to go through some general properties of these regulatory circuits and learn the terminology associated with them. In negative regulation, the binding of a regulator causes a decrease in transcription. The regulating protein is called a repressor. This type of regulation is common in the cell. The two players in the system are the repressor and RNA polymerase. The figure shows the LAC-I repressor binding to DNA. Note that it has two identical domains. Some more terminology. A set of genes that are transcribed into a single messenger RNA is called an operon. In practice, genes under negative regulation will have a good promoter, something RNA polymerase will readily bind to. The active repressor binds near the promoter and blocks RNA polymerase from accessing its promoter. Thus, RNA polymerase cannot transcribe the operon. If the repressor becomes inactive, which is a reversible event, it falls off its binding site, leaving the promoter open. RNA polymerase can then transcribe the operon. There are two types of negative regulation, induction and repression. In induction, the repressor is synthesized in an active state and binds to the operon, preventing transcription. The repressor responds to a small molecule, in this case called an inducer. Inducer binding inactivates the repressor, causing it to fall off the DNA. In repression, also with negative regulation, the repressor is synthesized in an inactive state and does not immediately bind to the operon. The repressor's response to a small molecule, in this case called a co-repressor, Binding of co-repressor activates the repressor, causing it to bind to the DNA and block transcription. Let's test your understanding of what we just went through. The tryptophan operon, TRIP, synthesizes the amino acid tryptophan and has a TRIP repressor protein that is inactive when synthesized. The presence of tryptophan causes the transcription of the TRIP genes to decrease. This is an example of... Second question. The lactose operon produces catabolic genes that degrade lactose and has a lac repressor protein that is synthesized in the active state. The presence of lactose causes transcription of the lac genes to increase. This is an example of... Okay, the answer to the first question is B. The trip repressor is inactive to begin with and then binds to the operon when its co-repressor tryptophan binds to it. That is a classic repression pathway. This answer to the second one is A. 
Since the repressor is active before its signal molecule binds, this is an example of induction. By the way, both of these are examples of negative regulation since they both involve a repressor. I know I'm kind of beating this very hard or pounding on this very hard. The reason I'm doing that is students often are confused about what's negative regulation. How can induction where the operon turns on still be negative regulation? It is. The other type of regulation is positive regulation. A protein termed an activator increases transcription when bound to DNA. Typically, these operons have poor promoters. They're not as easily recognized by RNA polymerase. Binding of the activator near the promoter allows protein-protein contacts with the RNA polymerase. Thus, the activator recruits RNA polymerase to the operon and increases transcription. An example of a positive regulation is the maltose operon. The malty protein is an allosteric protein that activates when maltose is bound to it. It then binds to its site on the DNA and recruits RNA polymerase to the maltose promoter. RNA polymerase then transcribes the operon. Another question. There's going to be lots of questions in these lectures because I want to make sure you get this. Which feature of the malty protein changes in the presence absence of the co-activator maltose? The answer is D, the ability of the protein to bind DNA. Binding of maltose to malty causes a conformational change in the protein. This change enables the protein to bind to its site on the DNA and recruit RNA polymerase. RNA molecules can also regulate gene expression. One example is antisense RNA. Antisense RNA is a complementary piece of RNA that can bind to a messenger RNA and either block or encourage its translation. For example, gene A is the messenger RNA. In the absence of gene X RNA, gene A is translated into protein A. Gene X is an antisense RNA that, if synthesized, will form a double helix with gene A and prevent its translation. These types of systems can be trans, where the antisense transcript is from a separate gene, as shown here, gene X and gene A, or cis, where the transcript that is the antisense RNA is transcribed directly from the complementary strand of DNA. A recent example of antisense regulation is the SIM-E-SIM-R system of E. coli. It seems to be involved in resource recycling of damaged RNAs. The SIM-E protein digests RNA, normally an activity you want to repress. SIM-R achieves this by being transcribed and then blocking the translation of SIM-E. You may wonder why a bacterium would want an activity that degrades all messenger RNA. When there is extensive nucleic acid damage, an SOS response occurs. During an SOS response, the cell does not want to translate messenger RNA since it may result in damaged proteins or even clog up the ribosome. So the cell turns off all messenger RNA transcription and translation, but it also wants to get rid of any messenger RNAs that have been synthesized. The SOS response inhibits SIMR expression. It cannot perform its function, and the SIM-E protein then helps to recycle damaged RNAs. Another type of regulation of gene expression not involving a protein is riboswitches. In this case, a small molecule binds to messenger RNA and modulates transcription or translation of the message. This regulation involves the changing of the secondary structure of the messenger RNA in response to the binding of a small molecule. In the example shown here, sequences 1 and 2 or 2 and 3 are complementary and capable of forming a stem loop structure. When there is no small molecule, 1 and 2 form a stem loop, and 3, which is the shine delgarno sequence, is bound by the ribosome and translation proceeds. If the small molecule binds, it occupies region 1, and 2 binds with 3, blocking the shine delgarno sequence and blocking translation. Thus, the signal metabolite can stop 
translation of the message. There are numerous examples of ribose switches in bacteria. Anions, metals, purines, cofactors, and amino acids can all serve as ribose switches and regulate a number of biosynthesis pathways. For example, thiamine pyrophosphate will bind to the messenger RNA that encodes the enzymes for its own synthesis and shut off translation of the messenger RNA. Different ribose switches can block transcription, allow transcription, block translation, or allow translation. A second example of a ribose switch controls the expression of an adenine efflux pump, YDHL. If the concentration of adenine gets too high, it can be toxic for the cell, so a pump is synthesized to move it out of the cell. The A ribose switch is found in the YDHL gene. When adenine is absent, the secondary structure of the messenger RNA of YDHL forms a stem loop structure shown in the off part of the figure. This is a row dependent terminator, thus shutting off transcription in the absence of adenine. If adenine is present, it binds to the messenger RNA shown in the on figure and forms a different secondary structure and blocks the formation of the terminator. I will repeat this several times throughout these lectures because this is again a common misconception that students have. Every stem loop structure in a messenger RNA is not a row independent terminator, right? You have to have a specific structure to have that terminator. And the secondary structure in the on position is not the terminator. To summarize, here are the common forms of regulation we have covered in this lecture. In negative regulation, the promoter is usually good. The repressor blocks RNA polymerase access, and regulation can be either induction or repression. In activation, the promoter is usually poor. The activator binds to DNA and recruits RNA polymerase to the promoter to begin transcription. You can also have changes in sigma act factor activity. We'll talk about this in subsequent lectures and you, you can vary access to the DNA. We also talked about antisense RNA, which binds to messenger RNA and prevents its translation. There are also examples where it can promote its translation, and we'll explore these when we go through quorum sensing in gram-positive bacteria. Finally, rival switches involve small molecules, purines, amino acids, cofactors, and others, that bind to DNA and can affect transcription or translation of the mRNA target. Expression can go up or down by the action of the riboswitch. All right, that is it for the introduction to regulation.